Growing up, I would spend my summers at my grandparents' cabin in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. There was a river close by where we would go swimming. And I remember the first time I tried to swim across the river. I was a strong swimmer, but the moment I hit the current in the center of the river, I was immediately swept downstream. I made it across, but had to hike way back up the opposite bank. I will never forget that horrible feeling of swimming with all my energy and yet being swept downstream by forces far more powerful than me. A lot of us feel like that in our spiritual formation. Like no matter how hard we try to become more like Jesus, we are being swept downstream by the forces of culture all around us and by forces inside our own heart. If you feel this way, you are not alone. Well, let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your mercy that is new every day, for your faithfulness in every season, for your goodness, for your promises that are true. Lord, to be gathered together today to worship you in spirit and in truth, to be reminded of your character, Lord, and of your, um, your faithfulness in our lives personally, but in your faithfulness in our life together as your people. Lord, I want to pray these words from St. Francis of Assisi and ask that these words would become our own as we prepare to hear your word today. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. Well, we are continuing our sermon series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7. And we've heard a lot of challenging things in this sermon over the last several weeks. Today's teaching just might be the most difficult of all of Jesus' sayings. It also might be the most important, though, uh, given how divided and polarized we are. I, I think of the late theologian John Stott, who insisted that, that this part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the part that we're about to hear, really is the high point in the sermon, and it gives us the heart of the gospel and shows us just how countercultural the kingdom of God really is. So hear the word of the Lord then from Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 38. This is from the NRSV, uh, but if you brought your Bible with you today, you're welcome to follow along with whatever version you have. Again, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 38, and we're going to be going all the way to 48. Hear the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, churn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain to the righteous and to the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than any other? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like I said, these may be some of the hardest words of Jesus in the entire Sermon on the Mount because they go so much against the grain of our own hearts and they go so much against the grain of the way that we're told that the world works. I mean, let's just be honest. When somebody attacks us, we want to fight back. When somebody hurts us, we want to hurt them back. When they insult us, we want to insult them back. We don't just get mad, but we get even. That's the way that the world works. But what does Jesus say? You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. Turn the other cheek. Give your cloak or your coat as well. Go also the second mile. What is Jesus saying here? Um, is he saying that disciples are just supposed to be doormats and punching bags? Like, like when people come after us, we just got to take it and we just kind of lay down? Is Jesus commanding us when he says, do not resist an evildoer, to turn a blind eye to evil and injustice in the world? Well, that's not what he's saying, and, and I'll say more about that in a minute, but maybe this will help. Let me give you some context of what he means when he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That, that principle comes from the law of Moses, and here's really kind of how this principle was used. It was actually intended to serve two purposes for, for the, the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, one is that it, it was a way of ensuring that justice was administered when there was a wrong that was done. And this was done actually through a, 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 judi a judicial kind of system with judges, but if somebody hurt another person, it, it was a way of making sure that there was a consequence, there was accountability to that. Um, but the other part that it served is that it was to ensure that the punishment fit the crime. And it was a way of making sure to put guardrails so that um, things just didn't begin to escalate. So let me give you an example. Um, Greg, can I use you as an example? Um, so if, if Greg punches me in the mouth and knocks out my tooth, which I'm just trying to picture you doing that, you would never do that, but if Greg would do that, then um, I, I wouldn't be able to cut off his hand, but I would be able to punch him back and knock out his tooth. Right? If Greg cut off my hand, uh, I wouldn't be able to take his life, but I would be able to cut off his hand. Or again, that had to be administered through kind of a judicial system, but, but the idea was it was to create constraint to make sure that, again, the punishment fit the crime. Here's what happened by the first century. When Jesus speaks these words, one of the ways that this was being interpreted by the religious leaders and others is that they were seeing it as that this was a way to take the law into your own hands. And it was a way for you to exact personal revenge and retaliation with people who had hurt you. And things just began to escalate because um, it, the, the whole idea was that somebody harms you, you fight back, and then they hit back harder, and you hit back harder, and you know how this goes. I mean, we see it play out all the time in our culture. Really what Jesus is getting at here, what he is addressing then, is personal revenge and retaliation. That's what he's speaking against. Let's just be clear, God never turns a blind eye to evil and injustice. And we are called to strive for justice. Um, Jesus is not calling us to turn a blind eye to, to injustice or to evil, but the point, the radical point that he is making is that it, it is not our place to retaliate and to seek personal revenge. Why? Well, two reasons. First, because vengeance is God's and God's alone. 
This is what Paul, Paul is taking Jesus' teaching and kind of doing a riff on it in Romans chapter 12 towards the end of chapter 12 where Paul talks about like it's, it's not your job to exact vengeance when other people hurt you, that God is the only perfect judge and that God will ultimately settle the score for the wrongs that have been done, whether God settles the score here and now through the right legal court processes or whether God will settle the score when Christ comes again in the last judgment, we can be assured that God will set things right. That if we've been hurt by somebody, that in the end, God ultimately will settle the score. But it's not our job to take that into our own hands. Here's the second reason why why Jesus would say, do not fall into kind of personal revenge. Because almost always, Retaliation and revenge is fueled by personal animosity and grievance. Animosity, feelings of hostility towards another, even hatred towards another. These animosity and grievance, these things are not reflective of Jesus' own heart. When somebody hurts you, getting even and hurting them back may make you feel good in the moment but so often it only makes the situation worse for you and for them. It will not heal your wound, and it will not undo the wrong that has been done. But animosity and grievance are also a kind of prison. They, they keep the person who holds on to it in bondage. It, animosity, resentment, has a way of crippling our spirit. Not only that, but the person who has injured us, when we hold on to animosity and are fueled by that, we are letting the person who injured us continue to have control and power over us. Jesus calls us to a different way, to the way of the kingdom. It is the way that leads to freedom and healing and transformation. So he gives four kind of mini illustrations of how we should respond to those who who, um, have wronged us. These are little vignettes. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, well give them, like go out of your way to be generous, give them your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, then choose to walk with them the second mile. Give to anyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Let me just say that as we move through the Sermon on the uh, the Mount, I want you to remember that as a rabbi, Jesus is a wisdom teacher. And so with all of these teachings, Jesus is speaking to a particular cultural context, and part of what we need the Holy Spirit to help us do is to think about wisdom in terms of how do we take this truth and apply it to our time and place and to our situation. That's what wisdom is, right? It's, it's, it's taking knowledge, taking truth, and saying, how does, this, how does this apply for us today? I think the heart of what Jesus is getting at in this teaching is that while we're called to resist evil and injustice in the world, we are not called to fight back in the way that the world fights that we are called to act in a way that is above retaliation and above revenge, that we refuse to hurt others back in the way that they've hurt us, that we refuse to meet hate with hate, injury with injury. Instead, as followers of Jesus, we choose a better way, and that is this, to meet hate with love, to meet cruelty with kindness, to meet selfishness with generosity, This leads to the second part of Jesus' teaching today. He says, you have heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Or another way to translate the Greek, so that you might show the world who you belong to, that you belong to the Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. It's not enough then simply to refuse to retaliate and seek revenge, Jesus says, although that's a good place to start. But to be his apprentice, to become like Jesus, is also about actively loving our enemies and seeking their good. 
The fourth century pastor, the, uh, Augustine of Hippo, put it this way, and I think, I think he gets this exactly right. He says, many have learned how to offer the other cheek. In other words, many of us have maybe kind of feared out the first part of Jesus' teaching with those who hurt us, that is to not repay evil with evil. We figure that out, but we yet do not know how to love him by whom we have been struck. And that is the hard part, at least for me. Maybe it is for you. You know, if somebody does something to me, I think that I can, you know, I can find a way to control myself and, and turn around and walk away. I can refuse to repay evil with evil. But this next part, this part of seeking to love those who aim to harm me, like to seek to bless those who insult me and curse me, how can we possibly do that? This is the part for me that just feels so hard. Well, it's impossible in our own strength. That is true. It, it is only in the power of God's love, the love that God has shown us in Christ, that love that unites us to Jesus as we receive this kind of love from God. It is only in that love that we are then able to turn around and to love our enemies in this sort of way. Now, when we talk about love today, can we just try to kind of disentangle this from sentimentality? I think often that's what we think of when we think about this call to love, is that it's an emotion, it's feelings of affection for somebody. Um, but that's, that's not what Jesus is saying here. The key word that he uses, you know this word agape, uh, that's the primary word that's most often used in the New Testament for love, is really not about an emotion. It's not about feeling affection for somebody. Uh, it's, it's about the decision to practice a kind of humble, sacrificial love that seeks the good of another. C.S. Lewis is so helpful for me on this. In his book, Mere Christianity, he has a whole, a whole chapter where he talks about charity. And one of the things that I just appreciate so much that he says in this is he says, um, and this, this just gets at so much of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Lewis says, look, we don't wait for our hearts to begin to feel compassion for someone before we act in love towards them. Lewis says, no, here's what we do. We make the decision, even when we maybe feel anger and frustration and even hostility towards someone, we make the decision to act in love towards them. And as we make the decision to act in love towards another, what begins to happen over time, as he says, the Holy Spirit works in such a way that our hearts begin to, to move to where our action is. And we find ourselves beginning to feel more compassion, or in the typical Lewis way, or at least we find ourselves disliking them a little bit less, which I appreciate, because maybe like that's a win if I could just dislike my enemies a little bit less. Of course, one of the primary ways that we get into action around loving our enemies, and Jesus gives us a practice to do this, is to pray. And I think this is the, the, the first and the best move, the best place to start as we struggle to love the difficult people in our lives. If we want our hearts to move towards where Jesus is calling us to go, this call to pray for those who persecute you. And as you think about enemies today, maybe there is somebody in your life or there's a group that you really see them as a capital E enemy, like they really are wanting to harm you or they have injured you. But for others of us, maybe, maybe a way to think about this teaching today is just the people in your life that are difficult for you to love. The people who aggravate you, the people who get under your skin, or maybe it's a group or whoever's like on, whoever the them is for you. When we pray for those who are difficult to love, not only is this an expression of love, a way of acting out this command to love our enemies, but it becomes the means so often by which God changes our own hearts and God grows our capacity to be able to love those difficult people. It was from the cross that Jesus prayed to the Father, prayed for his tormentors, who drove spikes into his hands and his feet. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus says, when you refuse to repay evil with evil, and when you choose to act in love, as hard as it is, towards those who are your enemies, Jesus says, don't you know that you are showing the world that you belong to your Father in heaven? 
Jesus goes on to say this. He says, you know, if, if you love those who love you, here's my paraphrase of this, if you, lo- if you love the people in your life who are already on your team, who agree with you, who think just like you, who you like being around, what reward do you have? Doesn't the world, like, love people in this way? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You do good to me, I'll do good to you. Anybody can do this, Jesus seems to be saying. Christians and non-Christians alike. But what sets you apart, what marks you distinctively as my own, is when you love the people that do not love you. And when you do that, Jesus says, then you will be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, what Jesus means by that, the Greek word for that, is not like moral perfectionism. So all the perfectionists among us take a deep breath. That's not what Jesus is saying. But the Greek word actually is best translated as you will be made mature and complete and whole as your Father is mature and complete and whole. To be perfect like our Heavenly Father, Jesus is saying, in effect, to be perfect is to become mature in the way that you love others in the way that the Father is mature in his love. Pastor Rich Viotis puts it this way, and I agree wholeheartedly with him on this. He says, the best measure of spiritual maturity is not how much you know about God or how pious you are or how religious you are, I would add, but it is how much you imitate his love toward your enemies. If you want to kind of do an audit of your own heart, and say, how well am I doing, kind of my life being conformed to the image of Jesus, this is the primary marker. Are you growing in your capacity to love the difficult people in your life? There is nobody, in my opinion, who I think exhibited Jesus' teaching of enemy love in modern times more powerfully than Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. One of his most moving sermons was titled, Love Your Enemies, and it was written by King while he was in a prison cell in Georgia. King, who suffered terrible racism and injustice, right? I mean, King is such, the whole civil rights movement is such a beautiful example of how to fight for justice, but not in the way that the world fights. And King, as he sat in this prison cell, was writing this sermon, and he was wrestling with this question of why and how Christians are to love. And he he described in his sermon, he wrote this. He wrote, hate multiplies hate. In a descending spiral of violence. And it is just as injurious to the person who hates as it is to the victim of their hate. It destroys us all. But above all, King preached, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Love is the only force, it is the only thing that can heal our deepest wounds and and, and that can transform an enemy into a friend, that can somehow mend broken relationships. For the last part of my sermon this morning, um, I wanna share with you a video about two, quote, enemies, unquote, who were transformed into friends. And it's, it's from a video series called The After Party, and there's a group of us in Trinity that are, we're engaging this curriculum it's about how Christians can engage in politics in a healthy way. And we're, we've been meeting every Thursday night. Um, it's been awesome. It's been so, so rich. I've just loved it so much. And this last Thursday night, uh, this, was the, this was a video. This was a story that we watched. And I was, I was just so moved by it that I, I thought, I, I gotta find a way to show this on Sunday. And so somehow, Andy Keller, who's amazing, was able to make this work out. So let me direct your attention to the screen. I'm Nancy French, and I am married to someone you've already heard from in this course, David French. I'm a best-selling author and an investigative journalist. Being married to David is sometimes difficult when I see the way that the public perceives him, especially in social media. I'm Kathy Kattenberg. I think I joined Twitter around 2007. I'm a political addict. I started reading National Review. David French was an editor and a writer on National Review at that time, had been for years. And I started reading David and disagreeing with him vehemently on everything. David and I disagree on abortion. That's one issue that David and I will never agree on. I'm sure of it, we will never agree on that. 
Well, being me, I start telling him exactly what I think. I would tweet it. Do you want women to die? Women have a right to control their own bodies. A woman is more important than the fetus. All things like that. He's criticized sometimes for legitimate reasons, for disagreements on issues, but most of the time it is personal and it is awful. I would get angry and then I would respond even more angrily the next time. In 2016, I wrote an article in the Washington Post that detailed my story of sexual abuse. I was abused by someone who was my vacation Bible school teacher. So I wrote an article. I wanted to publish it anonymously, but they don't do that at the Washington Post. And so I thought about it, decided to go ahead and publish under my name. I never talked about it before. The article went super viral. I got all kinds of social media response. I got emails from probably hundreds of people who told me stories of their own sexual abuse. Additionally, a lot of people criticized me. They were terribly uncharitable and it hurt my feelings a great deal because a lot of those people were from my quote unquote tribe. And so I decided in that moment that if anyone showed me kindness on social media, I was just gonna follow them. Previously, I only followed people that I sort of ideologically aligned with, but at this point, I was like, forget it, I'm going to go with kindness. And so I started following a bunch of people. One of the people that showed me kindness was named Kathy Kattenberg. I always knew there was a person named Nancy French and she was married to David French. I had looked at her profile, but I didn't know anything about her. Nancy shared a very personal and very painful story of her own. She herself had had tragedy in her life, and I was just filled with compassion for her. So I wrote to her and I said something along the lines of, I don't agree with your husband on things, but I have so much respect for you and for your courage. I think it's enormously brave of you to have written an article for the Washington Post so everybody knows what happened to you. I clicked follow, and every time I logged into Twitter, I saw her post, and she was not a huge fan of David. I just sort of scrolled past it and scrolled past it and scrolled past it. For about four months, every time I checked Twitter, I would see Kathy insulting David. So COVID hits and I see a message from Kathy posted publicly and she said, I will never eat again. I am stuck in this apartment. I cannot get groceries because of the COVID overload on the grocery delivery system. And she said, I just can't get any food. I don't think I'll ever get food. I didn't know it at the time, but Kathy was disabled and she couldn't leave her house. So Kathy posts that she's food insecure and she was so against David. She disliked him so much. However, I sent her a direct message and I said, hi, I'm Nancy French. I'm David French's wife. I saw your post. What can I do to help? She contacted me on Twitter, on direct message, and she offered to help. My phone rings and it's Kathy and she has this beautiful New York accent and I sound like I fell off a turnip truck and we laughed at that and she was asking me like why did you reach out and I said this is a treacherous time what can we do to help it was just astonishing to hear her voice on the phone and we worked on finding a grocery that would deliver the food and that whole process was pretty funny because I had to talk to Kathy on the phone and it was stuff like she wanted diced tomatoes, she wanted bananas, uh, you know, beef, just basic stuff. But when you talk to somebody, somebody about their food needs, it's very intimate. I placed the orders, nothing happened. The next day I called her back, hey Kathy, I'm still working on it. We talked to every day. At one point I was like, Kathy, I don't know what I'm going to do, I cannot get you food. And I said, the only thing I think we can do at this moment is to pray. And she said, okay, go ahead and pray. Well, I do not pray randomly with strangers over the phone, let alone praying with someone who I sort of considered hated us so much. So Kathy Kattenberg and I 
together on the phone, prayed that God would send her food. And it was very awkward and we laughed. I can't believe that any human being would do something like that so personally kind as that. We talked about a lot of topics. Um, the most hot button topic was abortion. We're very pro-life. She's had multiple abortions. And so she told me that story. And when we had that conversation, it was so moving to me because her story was devastating. And so instead of telling her that I disagreed with abortion, I just said, I'm very sorry for the circumstances that led up to that. And so I just showed her compassion. We worked and we worked and finally Kathy calls me and she's just crying. She was like, you're not going to believe it. I have, you know, two pounds of meat and four bananas. 30 minutes later, the phone rings again. My other orders had also come through. So now she had six pounds of meat. She had like 25 bananas. We had probably 30 cans of diced tomato. I mean, she was just like drowning in food. For her to take a person that she didn't trust because I was always attacking her husband and to call me and arrange to get me food, it was huge. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And from that point on, we were friends. I wanted to go meet Kathy in person because we had bonded. I got invited to perform at a storytelling event at Lincoln Center, which was a huge honor for me. And I thought maybe since it was close to where Kathy lived, she might want to go. I went to see Nancy. I was backstage. I had to give David Kathy's cell phone number. So when she arrived, David extends his arm and he escorts her into Lincoln Center. I knew somewhere that David and Kathy were sitting together listening to my story and that cracked me up so much. It made the whole night just sort of more magical. He was so kind. And it was the first time that I could really see graphically that a person can think very differently from me politically and be kind. And David is very, very kind. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. Oh my God! <laughs> hey there! It's so good to see you. Oh my God! How are you doing? I'm fine. It's so good to see you. And so we've kept in touch for two years and we've gotten closer and closer and closer. Nancy is the best friend that I have ever had in my life. She's not just my best friend now. I have never had a friend like Nancy before in my life. So how, how did Dr. King say it? Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. There's so many things I love about that story. One of the things I love the most is the way that it helps humanize other people. I think that's part of the problem of what we're in right now, is that we can't, we've, we've lost the humanity of each other. And I'm wondering how the Holy Spirit may be stirring you today to respond. Is there a person in your life that comes to mind who's been very difficult for you? Is it a group? What would it look like for you to take the first step of praying for that person or for that group of people? Or of taking an additional step and even intentionally making a move of expressing love and blessing them? That's your practice for this week. The daily prayer for someone that you consider an enemy, someone who is maybe difficult for you to love, and if you want to go one more step, to choose to act in a way that really seeks to bless that person. But I want to, before we wrap up with our final song this morning, I just want to give space for you to be able to respond to whatever the Spirit may be stirring in you this morning. How is God calling you, calling me to get into action? So let's pray. Lord, we take a moment just to just to sit, to sit with that story that we just heard. To be present to maybe names 
or faces that you're bringing to mind right now. People who may be very hard for us. God, give us the grace that we need to be able to take that step of even just, even if it's just to begin to hold them before you in prayer. Jesus, you told us that if we love just the people that are easy to love in our lives, where's the reward in that? Anybody can do that. But in this kingdom, your kingdom, and as your apprentices, your disciples, you call us to love the people that are difficult for us to love. And in doing that, we will show the world that we belong to you, that we are yours. So God, give us the grace that we need today to do that well. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.